Um, I'm going to start with my own confession to add to your earlier one. I have a really bad habit I'm trying to break. I spend a lot of my time thinking about politics and theology. I read a ton of books in school. <laughs> I spend a lot of time with churches and schools talking about faithful political witness. And I spend too much time on the internet watching people fight about politics and theology. And it often starts early in the morning. I am working on breaking this habit, but for years now I have used my phone as an alarm clock. And so the first thing I did in the morning after waking up in our Lord's creation was to open Twitter, scan the New York Times and the Washington Post apps, and then play a few news podcasts that I regularly listen to. There were days when it took me no less than 10 minutes to wake up in God's creation and slowly turn into a raging monster. The headlines are full of terrible news, of injustice, of abuse, of mistreatment of humans made in God's image. My social media was full of people who felt some kind of way about the same news I had just read. And this is the wildest part. We all can imagine when I say the people on social media are raging, we're thinking about all of our enemies, right? I'm thinking about the justice-seeking, faithful, good people that I know that seem wound so tightly they are ready to snap. And I say that about me. I mean, like I said, it took me less than 10 minutes to clench my fists and grit my teeth and be ready to scream in the morning. And I have learned that when I am feeling big feelings, I go to the Psalms. Ellen Davis, a brilliant Old Testament scholar, says that the Psalms encourage those who read them to bring to the work of theology the fullness of human capacity and experience to integrate those several domains that modern culture often insists on keeping separate. I'm just going to be upfront about it. I think it's my life's mission to tell the people of God that their spirituality and their politics are not separate things. And the Psalms refuse this dichotomy like almost nowhere else in Scripture. The Psalms are one of many places in the Bible where we learn that our feelings and our doctrine are not unrelated. Our personal lives and our corporate lives are not separate. Our inner spirituality is intimately connected with our political lives out in the world. We see this in just the first two psalms of the Psalter. On the one hand, the psalms are each their own. They're a unit of poetry intended to be read alone. But many scholars think the first two psalms of the Bible are an introduction. When people were putting the psalms together into a book for the people of God, the people who worked together to do that under the inspiration of God, because these first two psalms as an introduction to the whole book. And I don't have time to read the first psalm. I would really recommend, if you, like me, want to stop reading Twitter first thing in the morning, then Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 would be a great way to start your day. But Psalm 1 is this individual psalm. It describes these two ways that scripture and later Jewish and Christian traditions would draw on. This is the way of righteousness. This is the way of wickedness. It's primarily focused on the individual. If you would like to be blessed, act in this way. If you want to receive judgment, act in this way. And then Psalm 2, this other part of the introduction of the book of the Psalms, takes this intimate instruction for the individual and widens the scope. Now we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about nations. Even more than that, we're talking about God in his throne in heaven. We're talking about cosmic in scope. The Bible absolutely refuses to let us do what we modern people are so insistent on doing separating personal morality from political reality. And the Psalms especially keep us from separating our experience of political reality from our personal spirituality. So I want to encourage you to join me in mustering up those feelings that you might share with me about the internet and the political world and the disagreements that we have with people in our lives, all of those feelings of anger and angst and fear and exhaustion with the world, and take them with me to the word of God. I'm going to read Psalm 2 again because honestly I think I could just read it 10 times and that could be my whole sermon. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. 
Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is why I love the Psalms. This is the language that expresses the cry of human hearts. It's shaped Jewish and Christian liturgy for centuries. It's a speech for a community and also for an individual. It's speech from humans, and it is somehow also the word of God. And here in Psalm 2, we're going to see three things characteristic of most psalms, but I think they're described really well in this one psalm. First, a description of reality that we will probably recognize. Second, God's answer to that reality. And then finally, resulting counsel for us. So first, a description of reality. In the right now, all earthly powers rebel against God. Sometimes there are things, especially in the Old Testament, where we have to spend time understanding the context and learning the history and putting the passage in the place of a larger story to understand what's going on. But the beginning of this psalm I think we all can read and think, that is a world I know. The NIV says the nations conspire, but the NRSV and some other translations say the nations rage. The nations rage, the people's plot, the rulers of the earth band together against God. This is about a world so undone by sin that at all times and at all levels of power, people rage against God. They use their power in unjust, dehumanizing, abusive ways. How do we know this? How do we see this in Scripture? Most of the Old Testament directs God's judgment against Israel, against God's people. But when the ire of the prophets is turned to the nations, it's not for breaking the law given to Israel. It's not even for idol worship kind of in the abstract. The nations are judged for how they treat other human beings. And just a reminder, seeing as we are not Israel, we should be kind of afraid of these judgments against the nations. We belong to one. (laughs) The nations are condemned for violence and mistreating the poor and the vulnerable in Joel and Amos and Habakkuk and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, for oppressing the poor in Malachi and Isaiah, for gloating in others' destruction and taking advantage of others and enslaving people made in God's image in Ezekiel 29. Actually, I didn't even need to tell you any of that. We know that this is true. We see it in our world. We feel it. Scripture didn't need to describe how the nations rage. I don't think any of us are unfamiliar. But I have to tell y'all, it is a weird comfort for me to see these words. Because I know that God's word does not lie to us. It describes the world as we absolutely know it to be. So this psalm begins like so many other psalms and so many other places in scripture. Why? Why, God, why? Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the righteous suffer? Why don't you step in and save us now? Why? That little question why puts words to our deep and abiding sense that this is not how things were supposed to be. Something is broken. The world is fallen. Humans are messed up. Why, God? But this is a different why. This is not the why of Job or Jeremiah. This is not the why of the other Psalms asking God why justice, injustice is constant and pain is everywhere and things are hard. This is actually a rhetorical question. It needs to be read with the right inflection. So I'm going to read it again. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. There are questions here that express a deep conviction, an unshakable hope that the coming reign of God is so certain, so sure, so undeniable that we can be incredulous that the nations are raging at all. How silly of them. How futile, how ridiculous. This is the kind of hope that I want. 
And it's a hope that cannot be grounded in wishful thinking or the belief that the human spirit will prevail or the idea that if we all just come together, we can make a better world. It needs to be grounded in something truer and better. So then comes the next part of the psalm, God's answer. In verse 4, we get God's answer to this question. The one enthroned in heaven... I want to stop there. The one enthroned in heaven. I love this so much. The Psalms do this a lot when it comes to God and the nations. They're so big and powerful and scary. And then God. And every time I read these images in the Psalms, it makes me think of children's ministry. I sort of have a secret mission to talk about kids in every church that I preach in, both because I think we just, as a community, as a people of God throughout time and space, should work together in making our places good places for children to flourish, which, from what I've seen this morning, y'all are great at, (laughs) but also because I used to work in children's ministry, and it was the bane of my existence getting people to volunteer. So I don't know what y'all's needs are, but I just feel like it's my duty now to pay it forward and just be like, help the kids. Please volunteer with the kids. But I I do have a real reason for bringing up children's ministry, which is that every time I read something like this about God and the nations, it makes me think of the first time when I was working in children's ministry that I was thrown into a classroom of 20 toddlers. The children are raging. (laughs) They are running and yelling and spilling things and fighting over toys, and it was chaos. And I was 22 years old, out of college, and like thrown into this job. And for whatever reason that day, the, like the real teacher who had experience was, was late. And so I'm in this room of 20 toddlers, and they're running everywhere. And I don't have real authority. I don't think so. So I'm just sort of like pleading with them to be nice and like don't spit goldfish at each other. And like they could care less. Like I could, might as well have been invisible. And I'll never forget feeling like I am failing at my job, flailing around, and then the teacher walks in the room, and she's got a lot of experience, she's had some kids of her own, she knows what to do, and I am not joking, when she walked in the room, it stood still. Because the real authority had shown up. (laughs) This is what I think is happening here. We hear the nations conspiring, they're raging, they're fighting like children, and God is enthroned in heaven. Other translations take the Hebrew word here more directly. God is sitting. The nations are fighting like children, and God is sitting. And God is laughing. This is not joyous laughter. This is scorn. How ridiculous of you. The best way I can understand God laughing, because upon initial read, this seems kind of messed up, right? God's laughing at what's happening on earth. Real people are involved in this. The best way I can think about it is think back to a conversation I had in a class when I was in seminary. We were talking about women's roles in the church and the home, and I have to admit, people were already making me so angry. Someone had already said something about women being more easily deceived, so they shouldn't teach the Bible. Someone said women are weaker vessels, so they should stay at home. And I'm just getting angrier and angrier hearing this. And then this one person in the class raises his hand and says, love this conversation, Um, just want to add should we consider maybe that women aren't actually made in the image of God? And I have to tell y'all, I didn't mean to do it, but I laughed out loud. (laughs) Because I can have disagreements with people about this. I respect my friends who have deep convictions about what the text says about this, but we had moved into ridiculous territory and had gotten to the point where I just thought, what ridiculousness. Like, you're reading the same Bible that I read. Women are doing all these incredible things. God is using them in all these ways. Not made in the image of God. (laughs) And lest you think I'm comparing myself to God here, um, one of my favorite theologians, who ironically doesn't always have the best view of women, Augustine, said in his preaching on this psalm, I do really love him. I love him. I love that he's in heaven right now and has been restored in his views on this. Um, (laughs) Augustine said in his preaching on this psalm that God's laugh is not a physical laugh. God doesn't have a body. God doesn't have lungs so that he can laugh. You know what Augustine thought his laugh was? He thought God laughed through his saints, the people who foresee what is to come and are able to understand that the raging of the nations are only futile schemes. Now, in some ways, this is comforting. God's unconcerned. God laughs through us, Augustine thinks. 
In the face of these silly people and rulers who think they can actually effectively rebel against God, God is not worried. On the other hand, this is wildly discomforting. God is unconcerned. I remember hearing a famous pastor before the 2020 election say, God's on the throne, people, so don't worry about the election. We run the risk of platitudes here, right? God's on the throne, don't worry. God's on the throne, you don't need to work for justice or organize together or sacrifice anything or fight corruption or evil. But God's laughter is not the end of what this psalm tells us he does in response to the raging of the nations. It says in verse 5, he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And then in the next few verses describes what this king, this son, will do. The nations are his inheritance. He will break them with a rod of iron, dash them to pieces like pottery. This is God's answer. Many of the original readers or hearers of this psalm, many who heard it throughout Israel's history, would have heard this as a description of Israel's king. Many scholars today think this psalm was a coronation liturgy, language for the people of God to use together to anoint a king who, like many other places in the ancient Near East, thought that the king was the son of God, had a special relationship with their God. It's also possible that as Israel's kings failed again and again, and even the good ones really couldn't keep the people faithful, The nations raged against them, and this psalm was heard as describing the promised Messiah. At the very least, they would have started hearing this psalm as pointing towards something new. A human king cannot be an answer to the raging of the nations. He is just as prone to raging as they are. So Christians throughout history have seen in this psalm not merely a description of Israel's kings, but a description of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. This psalm is quoted all over the New Testament, and I would really love to show you every instance, but I will restrain myself. It's so important, though, because the psalms are crucial for the New Testament writers to identify and understand who Christ is. And this one psalm is so important because it's the only place in the Old Testament, to my knowledge, that talks about God's king, God's anointed one, and God's son in one little place. Maybe God's king, the coming Messiah, and God's Son are one person. God's answer to the nation's raging is not sitting up in heaven laughing at his wretched creatures. His answer is Emmanuel, God with us. God's answer to this rebellion is the victorious reign of Christ. So now you see, right, why the New Testament quotes this all the time. When we shrink the gospel down to an individual message about personal salvation, we miss the fact that Jesus is the answer not just to my individual broken heart, but to the raging of the nations. It's what God says at Jesus' baptism. This is my son. This is what God says in the transfiguration. This is my son. This is even what happens with some of the Roman officials after Christ is on the cross. He must have been the son of God. I promised we won't go too many other places, but... Because we're going to go somewhere, and if you didn't know, today is Transfiguration Sunday, the day the church has historically celebrated the transfiguration of Christ. It's the one place that I want us to quickly go. I'm going to go to Matthew 17. Jesus has just predicted his death, and then this crazy thing happens where Peter says no, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And then in verse 1 of chapter 17, it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son. Whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the wildest story. Psalm 2 describes this king, this anointed one, this son of God, and the transfiguration is this rare moment in the life of Jesus where some of his disciples get to see this truth about him, 
They know he's a good teacher. They know he does miracles and heals people, but they also saw him in this strange way God chose to come to us. A carpenter's son who got tired and hungry and dirty and was often accused of being too much fun at parties. Here they see glory. They fell down terrified. They see Jesus conversing with these figures they know and revere, Elijah and Moses, that tie them to their past and their people. They hear God say these words from our psalm, this is my son. And did you catch the last verse? Until the son of man has been raised from the dead. This is no earthly king. This is exercise of power in a way that we have never seen before. Okay, so this is God's response, Christ's victorious rule. What is our response? What does this psalm say to us who are still awaiting the return of Christ and the end of the raging and the plotting and the injustice? This is what the psalmist says in verses 10 through 12. Therefore, because of all of this story you've just heard, therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, a way of describing honor and appropriate kind of reverence, or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. And then this is the most direct, you know, line to us. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This closes Psalm 1 and 2. Psalm 1 starts, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. Blessed is that person. And then it ends, Blessed are all, not just the one, all. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. For everyone living in the already and the not yet, this is our response to the raging of the nations. Tell rulers the truth about who actually runs the universe and place your ultimate hope in the return of the rightful king. The rulers are held to account, wildly enough, through the people of God. Scholars disagree about whether these last few verses are supposed to be the voice of the king or the voice of the psalmist, but either way it is true that God puts into the mouth of his people Be warned, you rulers of the earth. This psalm tells us that part of our response to the raging of the nations is to tell them the truth about who really runs the universe. Some of us are called by God to do that very directly. Speak truth to power. Tell rulers that their power is slowly ending to their faces. Some of us are called to tell rulers this truth in much more boring ways. To show up to city council meetings, or school board meetings, or to our elected officials' offices and say the way we are treating people as a community is wrong because it turns out we're not actually in charge. God, who made all people in his image, is. Sometimes it will mean telling ourselves on a daily basis, those of us who live in the United States of America, especially those of us who have a U.S. passport, have power unrecognizable to most of the people of God throughout history. So it means telling us to be wise with the power we have, to be instructed by scripture on how to use it, to exercise it with trembling, and to ultimately submit it to God. But here is where I worry that we will get this counsel in this psalm a little wrong. This is where I start to get the same feeling I told you I get many mornings when I'm reading the news and scrolling Twitter. It's not just anger at other people or exhaustion at the world, it's the anger and exhaustion that comes from thinking I have to do this myself. I feel the injustice in the world. I hear this call to the people of God, and I go, we've got to really muscle it up together, guys, and get this done. I don't know you as a people very well, but I know me. (laughs) I know my church. I know lots of Christians around the country who are seeking justice, trying to bring flourishing to their communities. And I know that we are sometimes at risk of getting really excited about telling the rulers how it is. We have a romanticized notion of being prophetic, speaking truth to power, flipping tables, tweeting some searing indictment of the government. But there's another place in the New Testament where this passage is quoted. Not the part about Jesus being the son of God, which happens all over the place, but those first few verses about the nation's raging. It's in Acts 4, 
Peter and John have just healed a man. They've been dragged in front of the Sanhedrin and made to explain themselves. Peter has given this really beautiful description of the whole story of redemption, right? Tying in Jesus to the people of Israel, explaining this large story. And for some reason that's not really explained well, they finally get released from the Sanhedrin. It says in verse 23, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And then they do some really amazing biblical theology. They say, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They hear in the beginning of this psalm the description of the nations raging against Christ. It says in verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Did you notice what they did in the face of the nations raging? They prayed. They asked God to help them speak with boldness. They asked for power to heal people and perform signs and wonders. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And then right after verse 31 comes a section I imagine most of us are familiar with. In 32 it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This brothers and sisters, is what it looks like to call rulers to account, to serve the Lord, and as the final verse says, to take refuge in him. Some of us will flip tables. Some of us will have the rare opportunity to speak truth to power in a dramatic and risky way to affect change on a big scale, but most of us will not. But absolutely all of us have the opportunity to respond to the raging of the nations and the plotting of the powers and principalities with prayer, with preaching the gospel, and with resisting the power of mammon in our world by sharing recklessly, counting none of our possessions as our own, and working so that in our communities there is no needy person among us. This is our response to God's response to the reality of the world. We take refuge in him. Taking refuge in God does not mean staying silent about injustice or withdrawing from the world or stop voting or organizing because we don't need to burn ourselves out because God is on the throne. But it also means we don't fight injustice and seek goodness in our communities like we are the ones who have to save the world. You can speak truth to power for lots of reasons that aren't always good. (laughs) But we don't have to use the world's tactics. We don't have to let the ends justify the means. We don't need to burn ourselves out with constant anger and fear and exhaustion. Because taking, God, taking refuge in God means knowing the real, true story about the world. This true story can motivate more than speaking truth to power. It can mean sacrificing for the truth, serving people because of that truth, pouring yourself out in literal, material, financial ways for people who are vulnerable and impoverished in your community. Here's what's really important about this. Psalm 2, as I have said repeatedly, is not a nice story about the power of the human spirit or a universal moral imperative for justice. It's one piece in this wider story about God refusing to leave us in our sin, in our suffering, in our raging, and our plotting. It's a story that begins with God using Israel to bring blessing to the nations, that continues with their hope for a Messiah, climaxes with the death and resurrection of Christ, and continues on in the life of a people gathered around the risen Lord. The gift that we the people of God have to offer the world is not merely warnings to rulers that they better behave. Lots of people do that, 
We have the gift of giving warnings to rulers that come from the firm conviction that they really do have something to be worried about. What we have to offer a world weary of fighting for justice and continually not getting it is the truth that it is not up to us. We take refuge in God while we seek justice and mercy and goodness. Refuge because we know that we do not fight in vain. I'm not going to stop reading the news in the morning. (laughs) I think it's important. I probably won't get off Twitter either, unfortunately. But it's not a pious platitude to say that we should read the word of God before we hear about the nations raging. It's not a pious platitude. It's actually an act of political resistance to sit in our anger and fear and uncertainty and doubt and hear the word of the Lord that tells us a better and truer story is at the base of reality. There is a reality bigger and more beautiful than the raging of the nations, and we need to hear it if we want to seek justice and love mercy and create flourishing in our communities without fizzling out in our own anger and exhaustion. We need to hear that in the face of the nations raging, God not only laughs from his throne in heaven, but we are his laugh in the people of God who shared their possessions and ended the poverty in their community. And and just as one last other reference, because I just can't help it, it's too beautiful. We've spent all this time thinking about God up in his throne, and we've been a little wary about what that actually means, but there's another passage that describes God up in his throne. There's a passage that tells us how the story ends with God and his throne in a way that should motivate all of the justice-seeking work that we do. In Revelation 21, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne isn't laughing anymore. Instead, it says in verse 5, He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Let's pray.